Well, the holiday break has finally afforded me the chance to abandon my wife and kids and spend a little quality time in the garage. A little cleaning, a bit more Maho mill conversion work, and surprisingly, some 3D printing. No camera, no clothes, just let my hair down, cue up some podcasts, and watch the dog chew stuff to pieces. This is a little tooling rack. Not officially storage, maybe, but I thought a little tooling caddy might be handy. Something maybe to set up often used tools. This little sucker, believe it or not, took 27 hours to print. That seemed absurd to me and led me down the rabbit hole of nozzle sizes. This one was done with a 0.4 millimeter. The only bigger nozzle I have is 0.6, which is in the machine now and printing a two by three version of this. The 06 nozzle took the print time down to nine hours. Granted, the new print is a little bit smaller, two thirds, I guess, the size of this one. But according to the slicer anyway, this print would have taken about 16, which is a lot, but half the print time I put into this one. Long story short, I may just order a one millimeter nozzle. Do those exist? I think those exist. I'm starting to wonder if I dream that up now. I'll admit it, swapping nozzles was a little scary, but not too bad. Knowing me, I'll get much too comfortable doing it and break something sooner than later. Speaking of which, you know what someone should do? Not me, mind you, but someone. Make a rotating nozzle head. You know, like the optics selector you used to use on that microscope at Bible camp. I bet you can fit three nozzles on that. Sure, you might lose half inch of print height, but just think how convenient that could be. But 3D printing isn't why I gathered you all here today. Some of you might remember this, the Hot Shot 360 Easy Bake Oven I got not too long ago. And it's been doing great. Haven't used it a ton, but when you need it, it's super handy to have. It really only has one problem, if you could even call it a problem, but it's something I hope to address today. Stan, the guy who makes and sells these, ships the darn things with air inside. Air in a heat treat oven. What is this world coming? And if that weren't bad enough, the air in here is dead industrial and so austere. <clears throat> but if I'm being honest and just between us, it's not so much the air that I take issue with, but the oxygen. Little known fact, since about 1985, the FDA requires for air to actually be called and sold as air that it contain at least 21% oxygen. Oxygen in the air might be all well and good if all you want to do is breathe. But if you set your sights just a smidge higher and want to heat treat, well, that oxygen can cause problems. Specifically, oxygen, well, oxidizes your parts. Sounds a bit circular, I know, but science. Short story shorter, an oxygen-rich environment at the temperatures this oven can reach causes parts to get all scaly and crispy looking. And that crunchy, tasty crust is often extremely difficult to remove. If I can dig it up, I'll insert some video of quenched parts right out of this oven to show you what I mean. You see that, how gross those parts are? No one wants parts like that. Usually, after heat treatment, it's part and parcel of the process to just clean, scrub, wire brush, sand, grind, or do whatever to get them clean again. Acid baths and pickling, maybe, stuff like that. There are, though, tricks to help minimize this sort of inconvenience. Some people like to dip their parts in a chemical batter that keeps the oxygen away. Some put wood chips or paper in there, anything that might burn, in an attempt to capture the soles of the oxygen molecules before they can get to the red-hot steel surface. But, my internet friends, there is a third option. This past summer, I may or may not have attended an event where I may or may not have purchased an argon kit to retrofit to the oven. This may or may not be said kit. Also got a Noga pen for, you know, writing on your indicators and stuff. I'm not exactly sure what this is, but I think it's a Noga, maybe a manual nose and ear hair trimmer. And a six inch Windy Hill Foundry Square. Cast iron, made in the good old US of A, Mississippi. Seems to be exceedingly well made. No voids or defects. Though I'll be honest, I checked this with my machinist squares. It's not that good. Frankly, it's a bit rough. I think I might put this on the mill, clean it up a bit, maybe grind it in. But other than that, it's pretty darn cool. Hey, the 3D print finished. 
Looks pretty good, except my 3D printer ran out of ink. That's all that was left sticking out of the hot end. So now the caddy's about an inch too short. Now I wasn't around when that happened. I came out here just to find the 3D printer beeping its little heart out. I think you could just stick more filament in when that happens, if you catch it in time, I think. First time this has happened to me. But what I did was print these little two-tone wing tips. With that I'll just have to glue to the bottom. That seems to fit pretty good. I know, it looks kind of sharp. Miracle of miracles, and unlike Ralph Hinckley, I managed to find the instructions. It appears we only really need to drill some holes. Well, one hole. Let's get this installed, and then we'll talk about it. And more importantly, we'll try it out. Dang, Stan, what is this thing made out of? The instructions say to use a drill stop and only drill a quarter inch deep, but I don't have a drill stop for an 11 30 seconds bit. In fact, I don't have any drill stops. So I set the drill to bottom out on the one, two, three blocks when I'm a quarter inch in. Are all my drills dull? I am positive that that is only a quarter of an inch deep. I used another piece of insulation just to keep the good insulation from breaking out when the drill came through. I'm not sure if I went deep enough with that tap. The instructions say one third engagement. And that's how you go from not enough to too much. Why does that look so crooked? I don't know. Let's see how this thing fits. All right, I think we're done. That was pretty easy. Now, hold on, we're only like three lines in. Stan, I really like how you capitalize all the warnings to make sure all the holes and taps are square, just to make us feel bad for putting it in crooked. Next up is this flow meter bracket. You can never get this film off laser cut parts. How's that look from there? I wonder if this was supposed to go to the other set of screws. I've temporarily plumbed the oven to the second tap on the argon for the TIG welder. Long term, I plan to run the oven on nitrogen. For reasons that remain a mystery, I have quite a few bottles around that are more than half full that I can't use anymore. But I have no way to regulate their pressure, so for today, argon it is. That gas then comes down into the bottom of Stan's flow regulator. It's pushed in, I assume, by this fan, and out the top and into the oven chamber. Inside the oven, it's diffused by that tube we installed earlier. It's Inconel, should be able to handle the temperature. It's capped on the bottom and has four jets coming out the sides. It doesn't rotate, I'm doing that from the top with my hand. Step number B is now try this out. And in order to do that, we'll need a part to heat treat, which I don't have. So let's make something. Try as I might, I just couldn't get those lousy chips to break. Usually you can mess with feed rate or depth of cut. By the time they started behaving, well, the part was mostly done. That setup moved on me. 
That's no good. I'm starting to get the feeling I picked. Wow. Feeling I picked the wrong. Wow. I'm starting to get the feeling I picked the wrong material. This I think is 4140, but I don't have any pre-hardened stock on hand. Unless my inserts are dull. Is that possible? Standing it up like this shouldn't have been a problem or shouldn't be a problem. I mean, it is kind of a weird setup. It's pretty tall. Smart way to do it. Probably be lay it down and cut that 10 degree face in. So more of the thing is in the vise. But I would have had to stand it up for this next step anyway. So I just thought I'd do it all in one shot. I'm making a fly cutter, by the way. I don't know if I already said that out loud. So what do you think? Pretty all right for a fly cutter, huh? Though I do have a confession to make. There was a little foul play involved. I snuck in a little part change when you looked away. This is the part we started making, and somewhere along the way it turned into this. The original is mystery hardened scrap binium. This is known annealed material. There was no way I was gonna get these features cut into this part in that tragically amateur setup on the mill. Many years of wisdom told me I'd break a lot of small end mills, so I started over. Not that there was much work in this, but still, bruised the ego a little bit. Anyway, a fly cutter. I know I rushed through this a bit, and I often get complaints that I don't show enough machining anymore, but if I started to listen to everything my viewers asked for, well, let's just say that's a slippery slope to go down. I'm more than happy to oblige the more reasonable requests. But in this particular case, we already built a fly cutter, so go back to that video if you want details. The other one we made in that video had a different arbor on the back and will not fit the new Maho milling machine. This is just cylindrical shank, so I can use it anywhere. Heck, this might even fit my cordless drill. And second, frankly, fly cutters don't need to be heat treated. In fact, it's probably a bad idea to do so. A fella might even go so far as to use the word dangerous. Mild steel, cold rolled. If you want to make your own, those are just fine. I just figured if I tested the oven with just a chunk of whatever, that wouldn't be as exciting to see. Not to mention, it would have been a lot harder to make the rabbit butt joke. So I'm going to heat treat this strictly to test the argon purge, and then I'll temper it back. Probably a lot. According to the destructions, Stan suggests four to six CFH for the 360. So I guess we'll set that to, I don't know, five. Particular tool steel I'm working with wants to go directly into a heated oven. So I'm gonna start that now. It'll probably take more time for the argon to push all the air out of this than it will for this to get the temperature. I'm also gonna add a screw to the back and some high temperature wire, just so I have something to hold on to when I'm quenching. Here goes nothing. You know, when I was a kid, my grandmother used to always tell me, argon is heavier than air. The old lady was right. Make sure you do your argon purge on a sturdy bench. I don't have two cameras, please bear with me. I'm about to pull the part from the oven. Holy smokes, this thing is hot. Hold on, I should probably use some pliers. Hopefully this wire doesn't snap. I can already tell the part's a lot cleaner. Usually it's got a lot more of that scale hanging off of it when it comes out of the oven. Moment of truth, I suppose. This thing is probably still pretty hot. If all went well, well, that's coming off very easy. There's still some on there. I'm gonna go scrub this with just some soap and water. Usually I'd take this right over to the wire wheel, but let me get all this oily gunk off of here. And there it is. There's still some scale on there. Again, this was just some dish soap and warm water, a little nylon brush. A lot of it came right off, just sort of washed right away. Some of that deep surface scaling is still on there. I'm gonna go hit this on the wire wheel and see how easily that comes off.
That came off a lot easier. There's still some on there, though to be completely honest, I don't really know what to expect. I mean, the descaling has certainly put up a lot less of a fight than it did without the Argon Purge. And I'm sure there's some experimenting I could do with times and flow rates and all that stuff. But I think I'm pretty happy with that. All right, one more time. This is after a brief encounter with a scotch Bright wheel, the red or brown or whatever they are, the really mean ones. It's a thin wheel and I use it to clean out the slot so the high-speed steel would fit back in there. But the thin wheels are hard to sort of control pressure on, but I didn't really go nuts. There are still some places with some very tenacious surface oxide on there. Again, a lot less than it would have been without the Argon Purge. And I still want to temper this back a little bit, but in the essence of time, I might just throw it in the mill and try it out. Oh, this would also want to be cylindrically ground, which I can't do. It shouldn't be a big deal here for a fly cutter, but if this were any other tool except a fly cutter, you'd probably want the shank nice ground and cylindrical. You also wouldn't want to put this in an end mill holder. I'm going to put this in a collet. Collet will have some give to clamp onto whatever diameter this ends up being after heat treat. Let me prep some high speed steel and I'll meet you over at the Maho. Okay, so I could have polished that tool bit just a little bit more. But that's not what this video is about, is it? Let's head back to the bench. It's finally everyone's favorite part of the show. The end. Shooting you straight, first impressions are positive. I need more time with this. The Argon upgrade, I mean. Full with times and flow rates. Try it with different tool steels. So far, I only have a data point of one. It seemed to work well, but I need a little more time with it. Also, I can't imagine there'll be much difference when I switch to nitrogen, but I'll keep you posted. Speaking of noble gases, they're only noble on paper. Be mindful of pumping your small garage full of inert gas, lest you wake up dead. If you start feeling drowsy and you're anything like me, your first instinct might be to stop, drop, and roll. But don't. That's where the argon is. Well, I think that's all I've got. Thanks for watching, and as always, stay well ventilated, my friends.